Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. Let's join Pastor Paul Carlson for today's message. Superpower. Not just power, but superpower. Superpower. You know, there's like a there's like a hunger that people have for superpower, you know? People look for it. I mean, you look at the, the, the media, you know, and the movies and stuff and comic books. They've been coming to life on the big screen with all the superheroes and everything. You know, that, that's cool, I think. But it, I think what it is is there's a hunger in people for something more than the natural. And, and God's, that's who God is. I mean, he is the super king. He's the super power. He, I tell you what, he, he demonstrates himself in this earth realm that we live in, and wow, it's like, it's like you read the Old Testament, man, even in, in the Old Testament, it's like reading comic books of superheroes. I remember reading a joke one time about some uh, young child came home from Sunday school and was telling his dad about the lesson that he learned, and he was telling about, I don't know, I think it was like Joshua or someone, he says, yeah, you wouldn't believe it, Dad. He had machine guns, and he had... He had uh, cannons and tanks, and they took over the city, and it was just amazing. And the dad goes, really? Is that what happened? And the kid goes, well, if I told you what they told me, you'd never believe it. (laughs) Hey, yeah, I might write that one on my Facebook wall or something. Yeah, you know. John 10.10, let's look there. I want to talk this morning about having superpower, how to, how to have that superpower flowing in us. And I'm going to tell you this, the, the key to it is just staying full of life. Full of life. How simple is that? I think I make things too hard sometimes, you know, and preachers, we can do that. Oh, 15 steps to stay full of life. Full of life. Full of life. Jesus said this in John 10.10, one of my favorites. Jesus said this. He said, the thief doesn't come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Have you ever wondered why all the killing, stealing, and destroying is going on? I'll tell you what, it's not because of Jesus. It's because there's a thief running wild in the earth. Okay, but his time is ticking. Okay, Jesus said the thief is the one who steals, kills, destroy. You want to know if it's God? Well, ask yourself this. Is it stealing, killing, destroying? If it's doing any of those three, that's not God. Okay? Jesus said that's what the thief does. He steals, he kills, and destroys. People have stayed away from God. People have not gotten born again, you know, because they can't believe the condition the world is in. You know, if there is a God, how could he let it be? Well, it's because there's a thief on the earth. The things that you see that are stealing, killing, destroying, they're not coming from God, okay? And there's a whole sermon in there that that I've preached quite a few times. I'm not going to go to a great length today, but know this, that Jesus is Lord. He is not behind the stealing, killing, destroying. And, And I tell you what, he gave man authority. He gave man authority. We goofed it up. We gave, you know, through Adam, we gave it to the devil, and he is... He is equipping us to take back and to live a life that's full and and meaningful here on the earth and in heaven. Jesus said this. This is where I really wanted to go. In the second part of this verse, he says, I have come, or I came, that you would have life and that you'd have it more abundantly. So let me just qualify here and tell you what Jesus is talking about. You know, he said, I came that you might have life. What kind of life was he talking about? Well, he was talking about the God kind of life. He was talking about if we were going to give the Greek word, the Greek word is Zoe life. Zoe life. And what it means is it's the kind of life that God has, and it's the kind of life that Jesus has in him. It's what the Father had in him and what he gave the Son to have in him, and it's what Jesus demonstrated to the earth. Okay, when Jesus walked on this earth as a man, he was a man full of God life. And none of the other men on the earth at that time had God life in them. What did they have in them? They had death. They had the nature of death because that's what happened in the garden. See, when Adam, you know, disobeyed and he ate the fruit, whatever that was, it was an apple or a pear, I'm not sure. But when he ate it, it says this, 
or the Lord had told Adam, he says, the day you eat it, you will die. Now again, Adam didn't fall over dead like, you know, was it Snow White that ate the apple and she fell over and Prince Charming had to come and give her a kiss or something like that. And, well, it wasn't like that. But on the inside, Adam died. There was a change that took place. You could say this, that Adam was the first one born again, except it was in the reverse. So Adam had life, but when he ate that fruit, death came in, and death went and it infected the whole human race, okay? So, so that none of, none of us on the earth, you know, were walking around with our tanks full of this stuff Jesus was talking about. He said, I came that you would have life, not just life like, you know, you've been seeing demonstrated by other people, not just life like Uncle Fred, but life as God has it. He said, I came that you could partake of the very God kind of life. And this is where I'm going. Jesus didn't stop there. He says, I want you to have life. And he says, I want you to have life in abundance. In abundance. Can you say abundance? Another translation of that, I'll read you Williams, uh, Williams' New Testament. He says this, I, I've come for people to have life and have it till it overflows in them. So again, God came, Jesus came that you could have life and not just have, you know, what we would call in my generation a little dab will do you kind of life. Now you'd have to be my age to know what that's about probably. But there used to be a commercial on TV for some hair product and it was so good, so powerful, that all you needed was a little dab. And that's what they said. A little dab will do you. And, you know, of course, we all said that. I still say it today here, 50 years later or something. But anyway, you know, Jesus wasn't into that little dab kind of stuff. He was into this. He says, I want you full and I want you overflowing, overflowing with this kind of life. I want you to be walking around to where you're like contagious it's like if they get too close to you without a mask on, it might just jump on them, okay? That's what I want for you. I, I'm, I'm, Jesus, you know, he said this. He says, I don't want you just, you know, constantly giving everything you've got so you've got nothing in your tank. I want you so full it overflows and that the overflow hits everybody around you. That's how Jesus rolls. He says, life and have it overflowing in you. A couple other versions, I'll read these. The Wade translation says, to have life in its fullest measure. Another one, the Weiss translation says that they'd be possessing life in super abundance. So it's not a shortage kind of thing. It's not like, well, I don't know if we got enough to go around. Family hold back here. He says, I want you to take all you can fill and then have it overflowing in you. Be a mess in the spirit. You're walking down the road and they're like, oh man, who is that? You know, in the spirit, they're like, oh, goodness, goodness gracious, wow. John, let me give you a couple other life scriptures. We, we kind of alluded to this, but in John 5, 26, it says, For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. And then in, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 2, it says the life. What kind of life was it? Well, it was Zoe life. Zoe life. I mean, there's other words in, in the New Testament and the Old Testament that are translated as life. I think there's four different words, but this I can tell you is the word zoe. And it says, you could read it that way, it says the zoe was manifested. And we've seen and we bear witness and declare unto you that eternal life. Again, the translators, many times when they were translating this word zoe, they would tag along this word eternal with it and to the point where we talk about eternal life. But something to note is this, is that when the translators did that, it was a different day and a different age, okay? And the word eternal didn't mean necessarily what we think of today. When they used the word eternal, they were using a God identity word. And what they were saying is not that this life goes forever, what they were saying is that this is like the eternal's life. This is life as God has it. You know, that's why, you know, sometimes people talk about eternal life and people get this concocted idea that, well, that just means you're going to live forever. 
Well, that's cool and everything, but it isn't really what it's talking about. It's talking about a quality of life that comes right from heaven, comes from God himself. So he says, and we declare to you that this Zoe life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. So how does it look if someone that's human and, and walking the earth as a human has this kind of Zoe life in him? Well, look at Jesus. Look at the life that Jesus lived, and, and, and that'll tell you what this life is supposed to do in you. Now, there's many things we could say about that. But let me just say this. You'd, you'd have to agree with this. Jesus was not ruled by circumstances. He was not ruled by nature. He was not ruled by lack. He was not ruled by sickness. He was not ruled by death. He had life in him. He had power in him. We're talking about super power. Now, I read a story, you know, years ago about a man who was exposed to radium. And it said this, that the man lived, you know, quite a while after that because 50 years later, he said when he got around a Geiger counter, it would still tick because of the radium that he was exposed to. Now, radium is that, that element that they put in, you know, it's in watches. I don't have a watch on. If I had a watch on, I went like that, and I was in the movie theater, it would glow, you know, without... You know what I'm talking about? Nowadays, everybody's watch glows. You push a button, and I don't even wear a watch. I have a phone. So, any case. Uh, <laughs> but, and I have a thing on the wall. It says I'm doing okay. Nice. All right. So, <laughs> so this guy, even 50 years later, he got around a Geiger counter. It's still tick. Let me tell you something. You've been exposed to something more powerful than radium. You got, you've been exposed to something that when you get around a demon, it makes the demon tick. Do not be afraid of demons. Do not be afraid of sickness. You got life in you. You've got super power in you. Um, I love this story of Elisha, and I've totally messed up my notes, so I don't know where I'm at. But 2 Kings chapter 13, there's a, there's a brief, really brief story here. But Elisha, you know, in the Old Testament, the guys and gals did not have life in them. Okay, do you hear that? Nobody had it in them after Adam until Jesus. And Jesus made the way through his death, burial, and resurrection that you and I could partake of life. But in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God, the power of God would come upon the prophets and the priests and the kings. And one prophet that, that you know, I like and read all his stories is the prophet Elisha. And, you know, Elisha came after Elijah and, and actually had like a double portion of the anointing and had twice as many miracles recorded. And, 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 and here's a story of Elisha. He died, okay? Well, where are you going with that, pastor? What, what kind of power is that? He died. Well, here's Elisha. He died and they buried him. And like sometime later, you know, Maybe a year later, there's these guys, these, these uh, Israelis, they're out there, and this, this guy, another person died, and they're going to bury him. But they look out, and they see an enemy raider coming after him, and they said, we don't got time. And they say, here, here's the grave of Elisha. Let's throw him in there. They throw the dead body in the grave of Elisha, and there's enough superpower in Elisha's bones, even after he died, the dead person hit the bones and was resurrected. He came to life. What am I doing? I'm trying to tell you, give you an idea of what you got on the inside of you. You know, Christianity is not some mamby-pamby kind of thing. Oh, you know, I'll go to church, I'll do good, I'll do... You know, Jesus didn't come to set a new standard of morals. Is he into morality? Of course he is. And you got this life in you and you just let it, you live by it. It'll cause you to have, man, I tell you, I'm, I'm, when I, before I was saved, my goodness, I didn't even want to go there. But I'm telling you what, he works in you. That's not just what he came to do, though. He came to give you life. He came to give you what you lost through Adam. Jesus did that. So we're talking today about superpower. We're talking about staying full of superpower. Let me read a verse in Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to give you some things that we can do about staying full of superpower. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse, verse 6, 
it says this. It says, as you, therefore, talking to the church, talking to people like you and me, they got Jesus in them. He says, as you, therefore, have received Christ Jesus the Lord, well, walk in him. Demonstrate him. You know, I think that's the problem sometimes is we've got Sunday Christianity, you know, where, where we're feeling good. We can jump and shout on Sunday and, yeah, whoo, baby, healing, yeah, whoo. But tell you what, walk in him. Walk in him. Walk in him. You know, keep, keep his presence, you know, in your consciousness Monday through Sunday. Then he goes on, he says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. I like that part. You know, here's just one little snippet that can help all of us. We want to stay full? Be thankful, people. Be thankful. You know something that drains that drains me, drains the life in me, drains the power in me. You know, do you ever have something drain your battery? You know, I remember I was, Casey went out to Los Angeles uh, several years ago to do an internship. And, and um, I took her out there and, and, you know, wanted to get her settled in and everything. And, and so I got her there and I, she was living at a place that she was going to stay and I stayed with my aunt over in Glendale which is north of LA a few miles but I'm telling you what it's confusing to drive in LA when you're not used to it it takes me about a week to kind of get oriented and get used to it and everything and in the old days I don't know how we did it we had maps and you know we'd study maps and everything but but I, I thank God we got a day that I had a GPS in my phone and, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm the worst. Dana is really good. She's got like an inward compass and knows. She knows how to find the car at the, at the shopping mall when we park, you know. I, I, I lose, I don't have that gift. That's why I always park in the same spot, generally. You know, Mall of America, I'm right down there by the Urban Outfitter entrance. You know, it's me. I'm there. If I don't park there, where did I park? Huh. You know, and most cars got that beeper fe feature on them now. You hit the key and it goes, rrr, rrr, rrr. that's me finding my car. And, 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 um, but I remember we were, we were, you know, I was taking Casey home and then driving over to my aunt's to spend the night and then I'd come back and get Casey the next day and we were getting her, finding her place that she was going to work and all that kind of stuff that, that you do as a parent. And, and uh, my goodness, my, my, my phone was just getting the power sucked right out of it. And I, I, I didn't have a charger with me. Oh, panic gripped me. And, and I, I would just make it, barely make it home some nights to Aunt June's, you know. And I was like, wow, you know. I was really trying to be like Dana and have that, that compass thing working in me. But, but I remember then uh, Casey's, the lady that Casey was going to live with, Keith and Heidi Hershey had a friend that it was so perfect. She was a baker and she was a single mom who needed a nanny kind of person at her house and so she, Casey filled the bill. She lived there for three months and, and was just about a mile and a half from her work so she could walk there, and, and it was great. But, I mean, Casey's, Kate, the lady that Casey was going to live with, finally after about two days, she says, hey, I got an extra charger. Would you like that? I said, cool. You know what I found, though? Navigational programs on your phone just suck the power out of it. Just makes it go, you know, compared to just talking on the phone or texting Dana a picture of what's going on or something, you know, those things just go, Shh. you know what else will do that to your tank, spiritually speaking, is being negative. Being negative is like running a navigational program on your phone and it just goes, and all the power goes right out of it. And that happens. And, and, and you need to get plugged in and get charged up when them things happen. But here Paul said in Colossians, he says, hey dudes, do this, abound with thanksgiving. Let me read you the Cotton Patch version. It says, keep on walking in Christ uh, Jesus the Lord just as when you first received him. Sink your roots in him, bet your life on him, plant your feet firmly in the faith just as you were taught it. Then it says, bubble over with joyful thanks. Uh, is that descriptive or what? You want to be a powerful Christian? You want to be a powerful human being with the life of God demonstrated in you? Well, one thing you can do is just be thankful. Be thankful. Find something to be thankful for, you know. I mean, sometimes I know times are tough and everybody, you know, uh, you know, it looks like a bummer all around. Find something to be thankful. Say, hey, thank God. You know, I remember Dane and I, one time we were driving, we lived in Minneapolis, we were working at another church. And we were driving into church one day, it was, it was during the week, 
And, and I remember we, where we were because we used to drive by this coffee roastery kind of place, and I always would go, ah, it smells so good. You know, and then we'd drive on to church, you know, and everything. But, but I remember we were right about there, and, and, and we were just having the bummer, biggest bummer time in life, and everything was just kind of, you know, we were like salmon swimming upstream, and it was just, oh, it was bad. And I remember I looked at Dana, I says, well, Dana, thank God we're not in the middle of a nuclear war right now. You got to start where you're at sometimes, you know? And, and I said, Dana, isn't that great? I mean, nobody's shooting at us with machine guns. I mean, we're loving life, baby. Things are looking good, you know? Sometimes you got to break negativity and you got to just find something. Look hard and find something to be thankful for, you know? Thankful, thankful. You know, you, you could say, hey, thankful I live in America, thankful that I'm free to go to church without not having to be underground. There's places and people that have to go underground to go to church. And I'm not talking about the subway. I'm talking about they have to be secretive. Thank God for that. Thank, not for them, but for us. Praise the Lord. So being thankful will help keep your tank full. Reality is, it'll help you from leaking. You know, Sometimes people get full, but then they go out and they leak. And then they, they wonder where everything went. Thankfulness, it'll help keep you from leaking. Okay, here's a couple things in the next couple minutes. These are so basic, but I don't know about you, but I need to remind myself of them. Take time regularly to be in the Word. Take time, I'd like to say it this way, take time to fellowship with God in His Word. Now, you know, if you're like me, sometimes you can get into condemnation about this kind of stuff. You know, people say, What's your devotional life like? And you just flew out of bed that morning and, and barely had a cup of coffee while you were running out to your car and jumped in the car. and You didn't crack a Bible. You didn't do nothing. I mean, I think it's cool to have devotion time. You know, I got a little book I'm going through right now and my devotions, I, I do, it's great. But, but if, you, if, you're, if you flew out the door, well, well I'll tell you what. You kind of be like a cow and regurgitate some, some word that you have in you. You know, I don't think that any of this stuff is written so legalistically that you're supposed to just sit in a certain pose, you know, and, 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 and you know, with a certain lighting in the house, and everything's got to be perfect, and then you read your word. No, I think you should just grab hold of the word that you got and just, just you know, let it, let, it, let it be real to you. But let me read you this. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, this is something Paul said. He was talking to the people here. He says, for this reason, we thank God without ceasing. Wow. This is really cranking his tractor. What's up with this? He says, we're thanking God without ceasing about this stuff. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. So here's the deal. As you take time to be in the Word. I think this is more important than reading 10 chapters a day, okay? Look at that as a supernatural word. Look at it as words from heaven. Put value on the Word that you have. We're so blessed in America. I mean, I, I think I have 60-some translations of the Bible, not even on the Internet. You know, you add the Internet once, goodness, you know, it goes way up. But, but, you know, there's people, you, how many have heard this before? There's people, I've known people that live in those countries that can't have a Bible. You know, Helen, Helen uh, uh, Esker, she stayed with us one summer for three months, and, and then she visited us. She came to church, it was probably about five years ago. Some of you remember her. She was at, she'd just come from being on Billy Brim's um, program on TV. And you, get, you remember that? Anyway, Helen... When she got saved as a teenager in her church in Estonia, they, they, they couldn't have books of the Bible and Bible teaching and stuff. And they had one of Hagen's little tiny mini books that are like this big. And she was one of them that hand wrote that so that they could pass it on to other people. Man, you have to do that. You treasure these words. You treasure them. And, and they have impact in you. Paul said this. He says, man, you guys, I'm just like, I'm just like really, 
you know, cranked up about this because I see this. You received the word and you didn't just take it as a normal thing. You saw it as a word from God and it is working in you effectively. Now, in Mark chapter 4, I'm just going to give you this one. I love this little snippet of scripture. In Mark 4, 23, Jesus' words here. Um, it says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, in verse 24, he said, Take heed what you hear, because with the same measure you use, it'll be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. You know, the, most, the, the words I highlight in that verse are the last words where it says, More will be given. And here's the thing. When you come to church, this, this rule applies there too. But if you're at home reading the Bible or if you're, you know, you're listening to it in your car or something like that, there's so many ways you got your iPod on or whatever. Here's the thing that's the most important that Jesus said this. He says, listen, as you, as you hear the word, you know, receive it, you know, receive it and all that. But, but here's the deal. When you receive the word, it says more will be given to you. I, I, how many, you probably all have heard me say this before. When you come to church, it's not what I say that's as important as what the Holy Ghost will say about what I say. And if you follow that, you're doing good. But do you hear me this morning? It's what the Holy Ghost tells you about the Word. So you know... Again, you know, when my kids are growing up, you know, if one of them were sick, I, I had this back in the old days before computers. I had all these printed out pages of healing scriptures, and I'd read them. I think, I think there were 17 of them, 17 pages of them, and I'd read them through when the kids are in bed, and I'd read them. I'd say, all right, Lord, and I would look for is the one that was just illuminated to me. They went, yeah, yeah, and that's the baby I'd stand on. Those are the ones the Holy Ghost has given you. Those are the ones that God's talking to you. So, you know, you do that kind of stuff and you go through your day, then it'll come back to you and you'll go, oh, yeah. Mm, that's what I believe. That's what I'm standing on. Tell you what, that's what's filling your tank. Now, the other thing I wanted to hit on is this. Just taking time in God's presence. Again, these are just practical things I'm talking about. They're supernatural things, but they're practical of keeping our tanks full. Because if we want to have superpower, we need to have super-filled tanks. Tanks that Jesus said, you know, weren't just filled up, but they were filled to overflowing. You know, having life and having it overflowing in us. But Jesus, it says, he'd often withdraw. In Luke 5, it said he'd withdraw to lonely places or into the wilderness, another translation said. And he'd take time to be with the Father. He'd take time to fill his tank. He'd take time in the presence of God. I think that's a great thing to do. I remember, you know, being a missionary in Haiti, one of the guys that used to come down all the time was this guy named Scott Norling, a good friend of mine. And uh, we had many adventures together. And, and Scott was a rough and tough guy. He's a guy that one time, we, he had given me a truck to drive in Haiti. It was my little yellow Datsun, and, and, uh, and or he gave the ministry, but I was the only one there, so I drove it. And, and uh, I remember we were driving, he was, we were together in the car one time, we were going out in the country, and there was a roadblock up ahead, and that's nothing unusual. In countries like Haiti, they often have roadblocks where they check your passport. And Scott, he wanted me to run the roadblock to see if we could get him to fire their guns. This is the kind of guy he is. I know. God use everybody. <laughs> I said, Scott, that'd be great. If they fire our guns, we could keep going, but I got to come back on here the next day because I live here. I said, I'm not doing that. He says, ah, you wimp. Anyway. <laughs> but, you know, in any case, I could tell you a bunch of Scott and adventures that we had. But one thing that always impressed me with Scott is that guy would get up every day and he'd spend time with God. And it was like filling his tank. Filling his tank. Sometimes we wonder, well, my, why don't I have the strength? Why don't I have the faith? Well, fill your tank. Fill your tank. Stay full. So simple. Such a principle. Our bodies will, will alarm us. They'll go, ah, ah, ah. you know, it's been three hours since you put anything in, you know. I went to a meeting this week, 
and, and I, I skipped lunch, and I went to this meeting, and, and uh, right in the middle of it, I could just hear my stomach going, and I was like, right then, I just tried to speak up and say something so nobody could hear my stomach growling. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I got home, I told Dana, I said, Dana, feed me. Ah. Feed your tank, fill your tank. Um, I'm going to skip right down to the story I want to tell you. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Story that many people know, Martha, Mary. Martha and Mary. And, and uh, I guess I want to start by asking you this. What's it like at your house when company's coming? You know? Is it a different kind of day when company's coming? I mean, you know, maybe they, they caught you by surprise and you see them pulling in the driveway and they, you yell, panic, company's coming. Hey, clean up! Ah! You know? Could be. I, I remember as a young lad uh, being at my grandmother's house when company was coming. There was, a, there was a few years where we actually lived with my grandmother, you know, and I was probably, it was before I was in school, so I was probably four or five. And I remember having company come at grandma's house, and she was very meticulous. And, and, and she'd get out before the company came, and she'd get all the table set. And here was her method. When she'd get the tablecloth on the table, she'd walk up to it, and she'd put her arm like this, you know, on the edge of the tablecloth, and where the table was, she'd put her hand there, and then she'd walk over to the other side of the table, and she'd, she'd measure it to see if it was exactly the same length on both sides. I'm like, whoa, Grandma, take a chill pill there, whoa. But she was just, that's how she was. And then I remember helping her because she'd get the whole table set, everything in. And I mean, we were not eating in the kitchen when company was coming. We were eating in the dining room, okay? Tablecloths out, t the plates are on. And what she'd often do is, is fix this little fruit salad thing, you know? And I think it came out of a can even, but, but she'd always serve that. And it was like a fruit cocktail, and, and uh, so one time, I remember, I, I put the fruit cocktails on the table before the company came, and, and the, the family has never forgotten this somehow. But when the company came and, and sat down to eat this fruit cocktail that had been prepared, they noticed that there were no maraschino cherries in the thing. And the reason was, as a young lad, you know, five we're talking, I had gone around to each of the cups before the company, and while Grandma was in the kitchen, and I ate all the, the cherries, because they were really good. I liked them. And, um, but I mean, these are the kind of things that go on before company comes. And then, then if you could imagine, you know, what if it was somebody coming to your house that was, in your mind, really important? Somebody that, that you know, I don't know who that would be, but, you know, if somebody was really important, you know, maybe it was a first time meeting with somebody. I remember going to Dana's parents' house for the very first time, you know, that was something else. But, uh, you know, her dad was in party mode, and I remember Faye was, was really what I call nerved up. And, you know, I've lived in the family for 30 years now, and I recognize Faye and Dana, go through the same kind of stuff. <laughs> and I've talked about it with him, yeah, kind of the nerved up thing there. But, but I mean, you know, company coming, company coming. So what if somebody important was coming to your house? You know, somebody that, that my goodness, let's pull out the best here. Well, Jesus was coming to Martha's house. She was coming to Martha's house for dinner. And, and it's, uh, it's where we pick up the story here. It says, Now it came to pass as they went, they entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister named Mary, which sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And I'm reading this out of the old King James. But in verse 40, it says, But Martha was cumbered about much service. And that's the whole reason I read the old King James, because I like that word, cumbered. Isn't that a funny word? Cumbered? Anyway. That's what hit, hit me. And it says, She was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, does not I not care that my sister doesn't help me? She's she, to serve alone. Bid her, therefore, that she'd come and give me a hand. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Now, here's the thing. 
reading that story, you know, some people are more prone to be Martha's and some people are more prone to be Mary's. But with Jesus, the message he was trying to get across is applicable to everyone. Whether you're a Martha or whether you're a Mary, it's the same. He said this, he said, one thing is needful. He didn't mean nothing else, you shouldn't be doing anything else. He didn't say, listen guys, let's become, uh, let's, let's adapt a vegetative lifestyle where we just kind of sit there and you know, hum or something like that and be, be aware of God's presence. He wasn't saying any of those things. What he was saying is he said, Martha, and here comes that word, he says, you're cumbered about many things. So I looked that word cumbered up in the Strong's and here's what it said. The word cumbered means to draw around, to draw away, to be distracted. It says to be driven about mentally and being, to be distracted and then to be over-occupied and too busy about a thing. What Martha was doing is she was caught up in cyberspace on her cell phone and she was so into the social media that she wasn't even aware that Jesus was in the room. Oh, isn't that right? I think that was in one translation. Uh, but, you know, whatever it is, I'm telling you what, they didn't have the, the social media back then. They didn't have the internet back then. But I'm telling you, in every age, there have been distractions. And all Jesus was saying is this, whatever you're doing, be aware of the presence of God. You know, there was a guy that lived in France and I could, I think the date goes back to the 1600s. Honestly, I'd have to check, but it was a long time ago. We'll, we'll say that. Give me that much, okay? Brother Lawrence. And he wrote a book, and the book was called Practicing His Presence, okay? And, and the whole concept that Brother Lawrence tried to put out there was this. He, he was just a young teenager when he got born again, and he, he had this, this idea come to him that, he was going to practice the presence of God, not just in church, not just in church, but every day. And he says, and this is how his book goes. I mean, his book is honestly, in my opinion, was kind of boring. It was like a diary, reading all the days that would come. And some days he'd do good, and sometimes he'd do bad, and then he'd come back and do it. But the concept was beautiful. He said, even if I'm peeling potatoes in the monastery, I'm going to peel them with an awareness that Jesus is there, that God's in the room. His power is here at my disposal. I tell you what, you live in that kind of realm, someone knocks on the door and needs some, some kind of prayer, I'm telling you what, superpower is there. Superpower is there. That's what we're talking about here, is staying full of superpower. And the truth is, it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which we, we, we know this one. It says, trust in the Lord with all your hearts. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct your path. Basically, that's what, what Brother Lawrence came up with. Don't lean on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways. So that means whatever you're doing, acknowledge him. Acknowledge him. Be aware. Practice this. Now, don't beat yourself up if tomorrow you get all caught up in the world and you, do, you pull a Martha. You know what? You can recover from being a Martha, even if you do it repetitively. There's a new day. His mercies are new every day. All Jesus was saying is this, guys. Listen, don't let the world, don't let distractions capture your mind, but make the decision I'm going to be aware of God. Thank you for listening to Liberty Christian Center's podcast. To partner with this ministry or for any additional information, please visit libertychristiancenter.org.